Welcome, everybody. Um, apologies from Camilla and um, Anna. And Paul Rue is on his way, stuck in the, on a train that's not working. Um, everyone happy with the minutes? Um, any declarations of interest? Um, we've got no matters arising for this meeting. So, David, we're straight into your report, please. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you, David. Um, so, this is um, a longish report, and um, I've got uh, a couple of items uh, that I'd like to add, uh, which are not actually recorded at the, um, in the paper itself, David. So, um, I'll pause at um, given points during this um, so members of the board can. Um, raise questions um, and raise points of, um, for discussion. So uh, in paragraph one, I'm updating you on the work uh, that has been undertaken on values. This was agreed by yourselves at the last board meeting and was launched at a conference uh, over in North London uh, earlier uh, in October. Um, the launch was uh, broadcast to the organisation which allowed a significant number of other people not at the conference. We had over 400 at the conference, but not at the conference to join in. Um, so this uh, month of October is um, described as a month where we'll absorb the value. So there are conversations going across, uh, on across the organisation. November is values month, and each week in November we'll take a different one of the values, and there'll be a mixture of activities going on. Um, an example of this. Um, I uh, interviewed Roger Klein on what integrity means for him. Uh, that will be broadcast and available through the organisation. It's just one of the kind of stimulus uh, materials that will be used uh, during the month. And uh, that will all culminate in a document at the end of uh, December, which will conclude uh, the development of this work and its embedding in the organisation. Um, handbooks have been published. Um, there are two or three further handbooks yet to be worked on and yet to be published, but um, the progress uh, uh, continues. The importance of these handbooks is it declares uh, in a clear and transparent way how we're going to go about inspecting, and it's there for um, um, providers um, uh, as an explanation of how we'll approach this. Um, can I just hold, hold you there, David? Yeah. Give Robert a chance to catch up. Because I'm just due to that you may have a view on that. So, any any questions on the um, on the values or on the handbooks that anyone would like to raise? No. I mean, I think the handbooks have been excellent, actually. I mean, really, I don't know how any feedback from providers at all. On, on I mean, Mike in your area, or Andrea, or Steve? Uh, no, but I take that as a good sign, probably. <laughs> In, in general, they've been welcomed. I mean, and as you know, we've kind of developed them in co-production with a whole range of people, and so I think um, it's been it's been good for people to see the fruits of their labours as well as our own. So, just on the leadership conference that um, that we had, what two weeks ago, uh, I think there were 400 people that came to it when the values were launched. I mean, um, Kay, Kay, you were there, Robert, you were there. I mean, it was a really, I mean, there was a good buzz in the room, and I think people felt that. They were their values, not our values, but everyone's values. I thought it was a really good session, so it went really well, I think. Did you feel that, Robert, as well? Um, I did. I thought, it, well, firstly, from a personal point of view, it was really good to be able to meet a lot of staff. And what impressed me amongst uh, everything else was their, um, they clearly felt free to talk to me about things in a very frank way. Um, good, good things, worries and so on. And um, I thought that was a sign of an organisation that, at least on its way to being very healthy indeed. And, and I thought they all were very impressive people. No, I, I mean, I think it was, it was really good. Um, I mean, there were 400 people there. There was a good feeling in the room. They were open. Um, and Paul did a wonderful job comparing <laughs> the values. I mean, he's missed his vocation. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was, was a good, positive event. And um, yeah, I was really pleased to be there. David, you carry on? Oh, Paul, sorry. Not, not commenting on the comparing. Um, Why not? Well, no, but I just want to draw the, um, the link between the values and the handbooks. So even though the handbooks were largely were developed before we launched the, the, the values, um, it's great that you're, you know, you're saying they're a, they're a great set, that's what we're hearing, but the, 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 the sense of the values around teamwork, integrity and, ex and excellence, that's what I think what actually has what made them good documents. So we, it wasn't something that was born out of policy or... 
born out of an individual inspecting director who worked quite hard to make sure that everybody was included <coughs> internally and externally. So we're using that as a bit of a case study of the, of the values in action. David. I think he's after a BAFTA person. But anyway, um, so the next, um, the next um, two, um, I, I wouldn't mind taking together, although they are um, separate items in their own right. And they both relate to the duty of candour and the fit and proper person relate to changes to the regulations, which for the range of our responsibilities uh, come in from the 1st of April 2015. But both the fit and proper person test and the duty of candour for NHS um, trust and foundation trust come in from the middle of November of this year. Um, in relation to the duty of candour, um, the purpose of this is to ensure that providers are open and honest um, when things go wrong with the care and treatment of an individual and that the organisation then provides uh, the, that individual with reasonable support, truthful information in inverted commas, and a written apology. The definition of the incidents to be notified uh, is the one that's existed in the NHS for a long time, which is serious harm, but um, that has been um, expanded, ex extended, if you wish. and. Um, What's required is where harm has occurred, um, an incident has occurred, then individuals must be given, and it's set out in the report, a truthful uh, account of the incident, an explanation in writing about the enquiries and investigations that will be undertaken, and an apology in writing, and uh, that providers must maintain appropriate written records, as well as offering support in relation to the individual. So what that then raises is what is our role where that responsibility is on the trust to make sure that they've got those arrangements in place and where incidents occur, they're um, behaving in a way which is consistent with this um, requirement, um, expectation. Some would argue it's good practice, but this requirement in regulations. Um, so I think um, the report sets this out, an assessment of providers on application for registration. Um, it's embedded uh, within the assessment framework that uh, Mike and uh, his teams are taking forward. Um, the prompt question is in there, are, are people who use services told when something goes wrong, given an apology and informed what actions are taken? Um, we uh, pursue this under the question, is it safe? Um, and um, will they also capture this as part of our intelligent monitoring uh, approach, the work that Paul and his team uh, lead on? Um, we also intend to sample incidents reported to NRLS. Uh, that's both serious and moderate, um, and incident logs held at the trust level and assess these against the duty of candor thresholds. Um, the work is still uh, going on in relation to landing this. It's not yet uh, finalised um, so that the hospital inspectorate colleagues can inspect against the duty of candor from mid-November. And again, there are some um, bullets down there about the work that is being undertaken over the next couple of weeks so that we're um, in a position uh, in the inspections that will take place during uh, November and December to actually apply this new regulation. That will include training those staff who will be on those inspections, carrying out the inspections during that period of time. And then for other staff, we've got the period between now and um, April 2015 to ensure uh, that our inspection workforce across all three directorates are uh, engaged. We've had discussions with uh, Action Against Medical Accidents. Um, that has, uh, the organisation has campaigned around the duty of candour for a long time based on some individual cases. And um, we're working with them about supporting some regional provider-focused events in relation to this as well. So it picks up on Andrea's point about co-production earlier. Um, the approach we're going to take is to use this um, first few months to embed the duty of candour in our inspection process. This is new right across the NHS in terms of its regulation and, and um, uh, we need to um, be clear about how we will approach this but also acknowledge that this is a new duty that's coming in. Is it worth me pausing there David on the duty of candour rather than rushing into the fit and proper first? Yeah. Um, anyone got any questions on it? Okay. Yep. 
there's, there's two things. Um, one is, um, in, in terms of our inspections, we've got um, the, the candor question here. I mean, I think, um, I, I would hope that what we would be able to do, at least on, on some occasions, is actually talk directly with the people, the patients or the families, um, who um, have been apologised to or had an explanation. Because, you know, you can look at a a letter, if you like, that was sent, but, um, you, you know, without actually knowing what um, the individuals were concerned about, because you can have letters that, that sort of apologise, but don't apologise for what actually happened, you know, forms of words. So if there was a way of uh, building that into our inspection where we could actually speak to people who'd, you know, um, experienced the duty of candour. Um, and the other thing is the... Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk around um, sort of culture and honesty and, and openness and, and also this thing about sort of just culture. Um, I mean, the, the reason that people don't tell patients things is often because they're, um, well, they might be embarrassed, but they're also afraid, <laughs> you know. And I, I mean, I'm not quite sure what the answer is, but I think it's, it's about trying to stop a blame culture and, and move towards this kind of just culture. I mean, as, as an organisation, I think we can um, lead by example on that, um, which I think we are doing, actually. But it's just to sort of, just taking the, I mean, I know there's a specific duty and it's coming in and we need to prepare, but I think we also need to be mindful of the sort of wider culture, particularly when we're inspecting, you know, not just have they implemented the duty of candour, but, but I guess it's also talking to staff, actually, about it as well. Did they feel... Um, blamed? Did they feel supported? Um, because, you know, otherwise we, we potentially risk it becoming a more closed or more fear, you know, in the system. And I think we should really work hard to try and um, at least minimise it. You know, I don't think we can eliminate it completely. So. I, mean, I think we're going to have to learn over the next few months exactly how best to do to do this. Um, and we've already had a training uh, session on duty of candour for senior staff in the, the, the hospital's directorate. And as the paper says, we're also developing e-learning. But I think that suggestion is, is a good one. Um, Andrew has just reminded me that we have actually done just exactly as you suggested in a, in a recent inspection. Um, and, and so yet yeah, we have an example example there, and I, th I think we need to build on that. Just a wider point. I mean, there's candour about when harm's actually happened, but there's also something about candour about the risks of harm that could happen. And although, you know, we've got enough to do on the former, I don't know whether at some point our thinking could um, extend to the latter, where it's a risky environment and uh, somehow or other the, the system isn't candid enough with itself about that. I know it's a wider point, um, but it's just a thought. Um, well, it won't surprise you to know that I consider this to be a sort of seminal part of the um, uh, of getting the right culture going and the sorts of things that Kay has uh, said are absolutely important. Firstly, it is vital that the duty of candour, which is not easy to do, uh, leave, leave aside the difficulties about actually fessing up to something wrong having happened, um, it, actually organising how to do it is not easy, which is why the duty is on the organisation, uh, perhaps rather than the legal duty on the individual. And uh, it's important that it results in the patients and their families, where appropriate, understanding exactly what has happened and perhaps even more importantly, that they, that as a result of that, receive the support that they need. Um, but they're not the only people in the equation, as Kay has mentioned. The staff need support because uh, unless the organisation is told by the staff what has gone wrong, the organisation will not know. And I would suggest that the reg as we as regulators need to uh, find a means of looking to see whether that has happened, and Kay is also right in saying that a lot of the reasons it doesn't happen is because people are afraid of the consequences. And it seems to me that the principal consequence of discussing with your employer that something has gone wrong is that the employer and you and your colleagues learn from that experience. Uh, and uh, that's what the patients actually want to happen. Uh, and I think, therefore, I would suggest the regulator, uh, we as regulators need to play our part uh, in that. 
this is not meant to be a tick box exercise, uh, and therefore it is no use just looking at a f policy in a filing cabinet, or as Kay says, even at the correspondence. And please, can our inspectors ensure that the apologies, when given, are real apologies, which are actually deal with the case and are not a, a, a template on a word processor, uh, which is hugely offensive uh, to uh, patients. Um, it is a vital part, though, this to leading to what Kay require, suggests we need, which is absolutely right, which is a just culture. Uh, and this should be about making sure patients are told, the system learns, and this isn't about retribution. Um, so I think it's a good, good example of where we've got almost two, two roles here. So it, as it becomes a fundamental standard, it becomes something that we do have to specifically check and we have to, through the um, enforcement policy and the guidance against reg registration, uh, be clear about what constitutes a breach and in which cases we would prosecute or, um, or take enforcement action. Separate to that, and the point you're getting at, Robert, there's, um, we should use this and we are to embed it as part of our comprehensive assessment that really gets under the skin of the culture on the leadership as well as the safety. And I think the trick for us is to do both of those, that we don't, we don't either turn it into a very narrow thing, but equally that in our pursuit of understanding the culture, which we've got to do, we don't miss the fact that because it's in law, we have to do something quite specific. It's a bit like what we're going to talk about on the fit and proper person test. Thanks. Um, it would be impossible to be against the duty of candour, so that's obviously it's a good thing. But I do think it has the law of unintended consequences written into it. Um, and that is to say that um, patient alarm uh, and, uh, and staff and retribution against staff, it, it, deciding under what circumstances a letter needs to be sent, uh, deciding what actually happened in an instant is not straightforward. Um, uh, how you accommodate differing views. Uh, as a clinician, I remember a trust apologising to a patient of mine, a patient's family, in fact, um, for something that hadn't happened. Um, but they thought it was the right thing to do because the person had complained. Um, now, uh, getting that right, and, and bear in mind that um, when, when staff come for appraisal, when they are considered for uh, promotion and rewards, uh, at the moment, we can, a formal part of the consideration is complaints against, against staff. Uh, so it would be very important that, that the consequence is a positive one here and it isn't uh, a black mark against people who, uh, uh, whose uh, care is the subject of, uh, of duty of candour revelations. So of course I'm in favour of it, but, but the, the, the risk that this will be treated in the wrong way is really quite a high one. Uh, and uh, our job in uh, testing that out with, uh, with staff as well as patients is absolutely vital. I think mean, that's a good point to make, Lewis. Um, I mean, Mike, when just give us a flavour of uh, put the due to candor just slightly on one side, but in terms of getting at the real culture of the organisation, you know, the just culture, openness, um, the no blame, but clearly there's going to be blame when things are, go beyond a certain point. But do you feel that our inspectors are getting genuinely at the culture of the organisation? Uh, yes, I do. Um, not to say that we can't do it better, but I, I, I do think we are, and because I think we're doing it by coming at it from a whole lot of different angles. Um, so, for example, in each of the core services we go into, we, we look at incident reporting and incidents, and that's where we will be dealing with this specifically. But we learn a lot about the culture. Before we go on inspection, we learn about it from the staff survey. I've often said that it is the staff survey that is uh, the single most uh, informative data set from my point of view about a trust. And that has the questions about bullying. It has the questions about whether the, the um, people working in the trust would recommend the trust to others. So all of those questions, so we get a feel from that. You get a feel from um, sickness levels. If, if in one particular department the sickness levels are very high, it's always a prompt for me to say what's going on in that department. Um, and, and there may be an, a, a reason, but it's worth, worth a look. We get a lot of information from the focus groups. Um, and so if, if you're <coughs> sitting down with consultants, with junior doctors, with nurses, and saying, 
saying, tell us about the place, that's where we get a lot of the signals about, about culture. And I think that's where we will in the future be asking questions, so what about the duty of candour? And getting a feel from people who are there um, about all the, the issues you're raising, Lewis, which I think are absolutely valid ones, um, but we will get an impression from staff. And then, uh, towards the end of the inspection, we, we talk to the senior management and but we talked to senior management having already been informed by what we've heard and seen on the rest of our inspection. And we can then probe, you know, how well they think they are doing uh, in terms of openness and culture generally, but then specifically in terms of duty of candour. Um, good, thank you. Any, anyone else I can make a comment on this? Mm. Just wondered, after, say, um, after it's, be, it's um, you know, come into force, maybe, say, after six months or something we could have a um a report on how it's going you know um so we can kind of keep an eye on in unintended consequences um because i'm sure there will be some um it will be a kind of trade-off but i think it'll be quite helpful I, I don't know if six months is too soon but but you know just to keep an idea of what the issues that are emerging and yeah um thanks um, i think that's right kate <clears throat> um i think the unintended consequences was implicit in um the potential for us investigating individual cases. And this is the point I'm trying to make as well about this balance between investigating individual cases and looking, as Mike was saying, at the system that exists in a trust to make sure that there is an investigation and there is learning that takes place from that. And I think that speaks to your just culture point. But I think we do need to review it for the unintended consequences, but also what will this tell us about how we roll this out into uh, adult social care and primary medical services because um, the beauty we've got from this is not that Mike's team will go first but um, any learning we can extract will help us in relation to what we need to do in primary medical services and adult social care um, and some care homes will not have the infrastructure that a big uh, international teaching hospital have so the challenges that that presents are going to be very much different. Indeed, some small primary medical services won't have that kind of infrastructure as well. So they'll present different kind of issues, I think. Um, but it's a good point, so thank you. Um, on um, the other requirement that comes in from the 21st is the fit and proper person test. And um, this is, again, a responsibility that's um, placed on trust and NH Foundation Trust, trust governors, the Trust Development Authority, to ensure that execs and non-exec directors are of good character and are not unfit to undertake the role for which they're appointed. Um, Monitor will um, carry out this function when uh, Foundation Trust is subject to the regulatory regime, uh, where they change the chair, chief executive. Um, and what we've done uh, in the remainder of this paragraph is just go through uh, some of the issues um, that we know will be considered. Are people on the bar in lists? Have they been prohibited from holding relevant positions under the company's law, ch uh, charities act, etc.? Um, again, this is entirely new. And our approach to this is going to be about how do uh, organisations discharge this responsibility? And very much the approach that we're setting out uh, in this note, David, is that we will assess how uh, organisations in this uh, from November trusts are approaching this and considering um, the appointments that uh, they're making to these senior positions. Um, again, we need to uh, uh, develop uh, our systems and processes and then ensure staff are trained in the application of um, uh, these new systems and processes. That work is ongoing and um, will publish uh, staff guidance prior to the com commencement of the regulations later in November. And the training, again, will be delivered uh, through e-learning um, to ensure that people are good to go. Again, um, this rolls out in um, trusts in the NHS in the first instance, and then uh, from April 15, rolled out um, across uh, our other areas of responsibilities, the other sectors. So. Um, allows us to try it in uh, NHS trust, if that's not too unkind a phrase, and then develop uh, the way we work across the other sectors as well. <coughs> I'll leave it there, David. I don't know whether people... 
And just just to emphasise the point about uh, co-producing with uh, chairs and chief executives of trusts, we had a very useful roundtable meeting with them. I, th I think this is very much on their agenda because just about everybody we invited came to that meeting. Um, and um, but remembering that it, the duty is on them to make sure that they are appointing uh, directors who are fit and pro proper persons, um, and so they are very mindful of this. And I think um, as a result of that meeting, I think the Foundation Trust Network, amongst others, are going to work on, on guidance for uh, chairs and, and chief executives in this area, and we will obviously be closely watching that. A question, really, um, which is uh, if the regulation comes in um, very soon, uh, the consultation, uh, our, our response to the consultation is to be out at the end of October. Are, are we, is the system ready for this? <laughs> <clears throat> Robert, we will be ready. <laughs> are we fully ready now? Um, no, but we ha I think we are we're well on our way. What we have got to do is to make again make sure we incorporate this in the way that we do our inspections. But I think this bit will be particularly about the discussions we have at very senior level with the, the, the managers of, of organisations where we will be asking them the, the probing questions about how they go about assuring themselves um, that they uh, any new staff they're appointing are fit and proper persons and also their existing staff. And then thirdly, what would happen if a member of their existing um, executive team um, were to have a conviction or whatever, how would they handle that as well? So I think that will undoubtedly be part of the discussions we have, with, particularly with chairs, actually, um, d dur during the, the inspection programme. I think I'll leave it there, but if were I a, a fit and proper chairman and chief executive of a trust, I might at the moment be somewhat concerned as to what I was actually meant to be doing. I, I mean, I appreciate you've had meetings and so on, but... Um I, mean, I, th I think, Robert, that is why the, the Foundation Trust Network and others are working very hard on this so that they can get guidance to uh, th th their membership, and we will work very closely with them on that. So it, it's, it's not the first consultation that's happened on this one. So there was one um, at the early part of the year that the government ran uh, on the regulations themselves. Um, I think what we pick up is it's, it is one that they are, have been live to for some time and are very concerned about. So we'll have to see through inspection how many of them have put the appropriate processes in place. But I don't think it's new news, certainly, you know, on the basis of our consultation. I think... Your question, Robert, was, is the system ready for it? So um, let's take that in two parts. I think Mike answered what we're doing to get our staff ready. Um, there's a lot of guidance out there. Uh, Andrea in previous incarnations was responsible for some of it in terms of how you go about these appointments. But in the debate post your report, but also uh, from other sectors, we talked last night about the Financial Services Authority doing shadow interviews of people uh, who were going on to other boards. Um, the HSBC issue was raised uh, this week. Uh, as well and we're not doing shadow ratings it, i think the issue for this shadow is interviews. shadow re interviews yeah the the responsibility for this is on the trusts and our responsibility is to ensure that they're discharging that responsibility in an appropriate way which is very different than i think what's happening in financial regulation so i think the standards of this are going to be reasonably consistent across the organization because of the previous guidance but i do think to come to your question that in the nooks and crannies of this there'll be some things lurking which will be very very challenging and awkward for some trust boards and i think we need to be ready for this and i, I apologies i glossed over it um in the in presenting it but there is um in uh, the bottom third on page five um that we anticipate getting difficult cases and um, Mike will um, uh, chair a panel uh, where we've got those difficult cases referred. So I think we are anticipating some difficult cases which won't be straightforward, which will be out with the guidance. Um, and um, I think that, again, um, I think this notion of learning by doing, I think we are going to have to take each of these cases at a time, to use that uh, phrase, um, to check that we um, are clear about the guidance that has existed historically. It is good enough. Um, um, 
but I suspect we're going to be challenged on that as it goes through. I think we'll get individual cases referred to us of um, a whistleblower or somebody of concern raising issues in relation p to person X, Y and Z that's either been appointed or been on a board for a long time. I think there'll be challenges to people that have been in post, have not been in work or have been working in other sectors that come back, and I think they're the likely cases that we're going to have referred to us. And I do think that uh, we are going to have to activate these arrangements to consider difficult cases. Uh, uh, Michael, you've been through the FCA sort of process, I mean, how, how, the Financial Conduct Agency process. I mean, how do you, w w have you had any reflections on this? Yes, it's actually a joint um, PRA and FCA um, process. And you're literally um, grilled for about three hours um, on, you know, in my case, my uh, knowledge of um, insurance um, understanding of the roles of the PRA and the FCA and um, particularly what I uh, thought were, you know, in my case, Aviva's uh, key issues. So it was a pretty, um, pretty intensive uh, three hours. There were five uh, members of the panel who interviewed me. Now, what, what Aviva does, and I'm not suggesting that um, uh, trust should do this, but they actually give you, they give potential um, non-executives, and, and the same for executives, of course, because they have to go through this process too. Um, uh, in my case, two days of training, so that um, when I... Um, when the interview actually happened, I was sort of uh, reasonably prepared for it. I was very glad to have had the two days of training because I, I was surprised at the granularity of the questioning. Um, it, you know, I, I mean, they really did go into details that I wasn't expecting. I mean, it, uh, you know, technicalities about um, the amount of reserves of EVA had against particular risks, I mean, how it monitored risks and so on. So, um, and of course, you know, there have been a number of cases in which the PRA and the FCA have actually turned down people um, as a result. So I, I, I'm not sure this, you know, that sort of process is, you know, is, is right for Healthcare, it may actually be right for chairman of trusts, because I do think they have a you know, they're the and I, I'm not a hundred percent sure of, of this idea that everything starts or the tone starts from the top, but there is some truth in that, and the chairman is the top. And, you know, I'm thinking, I was taken by, struck by Robert's remarks at the dinner last night about, you know, some trust boards appear to be there to, um, or at least there's an attitude that they um, are there to ensure that their seats on the board remain um, uh, unchallenged. Um, and, you know, which is obviously a totally wrong objective for a non-executive director. Um, but what I'm confused, actually, the question I was going to ask is that I'm not entirely sure from reading this or from general understanding about the role of Monitor, the role of the TDA and our role in this, because are we actually saying that Monitor could have, could have approved the appointment of a chairman and CEO and, uh, and individual board members, and the CQC could say that we don't actually think that some of these are fit and proper um, people. So I, uh, I was actually going to ask where the boundaries lie between these, th you know, the three organisations, because I just wasn't, I wasn't clear. But on the other hand, I haven't, you know, looked into this in detail. So. <laughs> um, so, of course, we're not doing the FSA thing, and this is the point of comparison, is to say our job 
and I think this speaks to Michael's point about what are the role of other colleagues in this. Our job is to ensure that there is a system and process in place in a trust that the chair has been able to satisfy him or herself that the people being appointed into both executive and non-executive roles are fit and proper. And that's my reference to the guidance that exists um, about how this um, should be taken forward in terms of their appointment processes. Effectively, um, it's about their HR processes, their appointment processes. What we're trying to do in the first paragraph, Michael, is say that um, where a monitor um, may feel that they've got concerns in relation to their regulatory responsibilities about the chair and chief exec, and they use their powers to change the chair and chief executive in making that intervention, they need to ensure that the people that they're appointing to those foundation trusts are fit and proper in the meaning of uh, the legislation. Potentially, does that mean we can disagree with somebody that's appointed? Probably not agree with some, disagree with somebody that's been appointed because our job is to say what is the system and process that you've got in place to make that appointment. We're not there to re-interview you, to use the Aviva um, uh, example. We are there to ensure that there has been a fit and proper person. Now, I think we'll get lots of referrals about saying person X, Y, Z is not a fit and proper person. What are you going to do about it, CQC? And, and again, the, the, this is, the nooks and crannies are twofold. One is the nooks and crannies of individuals that have got a history or a past, and uh, at what point um, is that spent? I think they'll be referred to us, but I think there will also be concerns about um, whether the system that's in place is fit and proper. And I think, just going back to the values debate, some of this will not be about whether people have got convictions, but about their behaviours. And I think some of this is going to come back as a challenge to the behaviours, and that's where the difficulties, I think, are going to come in, how we judge the fit and properness of individuals. But I, I, does that answer your question about where the boundary lies between what we do and what monitor do? Of course, the TDA have a responsibility in relation to uh, their appointments. It's they, they are uh, overseeing, in a sense. They're the supervisor of the appointments to trusts. Yeah, I think that's a very good response, David, but of course I think it still leaves this element of ambiguity, which is that how can we tell whether a, let's say, a foundation trust has actually appointed fit and proper people, um, or it has a process to appoint fit and proper people, without looking at the people who've been appointed to see if they're fit and proper. It's, you know, it, it, this, is, it. this is the issue. No, 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 you've absolutely yes. got, uh, this is... <laughs> So maybe that's not a nook and a cranny. Maybe that's a, an ambiguity. Uh, maybe the limitations of my language. But you've absolutely got, Michael. I think what the challenge is to the system, but also the challenge to us in evaluating how effective that system is. But that's what Mike and uh, Paul and the teams have been working on. And um, I think we do have some opportunities for further discussion with non-execs between now and this coming in um, to actually go into some of the detail and, uh, and work out what some of the dilemmas are in relation to this. So I hope we can actually tease those out so we can be clear. But it also refers, um, well, it's why I use the phrase, we need to learn by doing as we go through this. I think we will get cases and we'll be able to uh, learn from those cases rather than we've been able to think through all potential circumstances that will arise and we've allowed for every single contingency. I, I think it's impossible to get to that position, to be honest. I suppose that the point being that a fit and proper process could appoint someone who wasn't fit and proper. I mean, just because the process is right doesn't mean to say that the, the outcome is right. Um, but I think we'll need to keep it under review again, Mike. Um, it'll be determined by individual cases, I expect, how this evolves. I, th I think it will. I think, and in terms of our inspection process, I think we will always address it in the comprehensive inspections, and that will be part of the sort of the, the, the interviews with the chair and the chief executive. But there will also, on top of that, be responsive uh, occasions when things are brought to our attention, and we won't wait until the next uh, comprehensive inspection. If there are concerns, we will then have to go and ask those questions of the chair and, and chief executive of the trust straight away. Thank, okay, Mike, thank you. David, you want to crack on? So I'll do the rest of this at speed, David, because I think uh, most of these things are issues that have been before the board before and are generally by way of updates. So, um, 
You previously decided that um, we will have um, arrangements in place for the review of ratings. Uh, the interim was to appoint uh, <coughs> CQC staff to oversee that pending the appointment of independent reviewers. That recruitment process is underway. Um, we do have uh, reviews to consider in relation to Dudley, and this report is referring to two other requests for reviews that have come through. So the ratings review manager and officer will consider uh, those in keeping with the uh, agreed position. Uh, I've done an update on recruitment just to um, report progress, and I think, David, I'll do this in every report to the board. Just before you, sorry, you go on. It, just uh, so on the, the review, review of ratings, Mike, can you give us a flavour? Uh, take, take, take the Dudley situation as, as a, I mean, without, I don't know what you can say here, but just give us a flavour of how it went and the, uh, whether well, it worked in your view. The answer is no, I can't at the moment, but, but, but for very, very good reason. I was part of the original um, process in that I chaired the National Quality Assurance Group um, the, the first time that, that Dudley came round, and as they asked for a review of ratings, I stepped aside from that. I have now just received all the paperwork back. It has been through a completely independent process, not led by me, um, and so I now have to take on board uh, what, what exactly what has happened, um, but you know, unless there is good reason not to, I will put, accept the recommendations of the independent review. So um, we have. What I can tell you is that it has been independently reviewed. It has been through a second national quality assurance group, and recommendations have just come back to me, um, which I am now considering. And if the chairman of the Dudley Foundation Trust was here, would he say, do you think, that it's been a fair and independent review? I mean, I'm not sure about the no, outcome of it, but the process. Uh, well, I, I very much hope so, because mm. I, I believe it will have mm. been. But as I say, I was completely separate okay. from it, and that was very deliberate. Um, and I will, I'm due to be speaking to people at Dudley within the next few days. Okay. Um, there's an update on recruitment, and you can see what we've had from August the 1st, 156 new starters across the directorate. We've previously flagged the issue of the risk of recruitment, and um, action has been taken. We've now got um, a, a plan in place, which is now uh, being delivered, and um, uh, new starters are beginning um, to be appointed and uh, take up their posts. Um, that goes on to the next paragraph, which is an update on the Academy. Again, some high-level figures in here um, showing that the Academy is now up and running and beginning to uh, deliver the training, which supports the changes to the methodologies. Um, uh, I've got even more numbers on this since this report was produced, but this gives you a sense of the progress that is being made on preparing people for the new uh, methodologies, but also on um, a training that will be uh, has begun to be delivered and is being offered to people on the uh, application of the Mental Capacity Act. Um, in paragraph 8, I just wanted uh, to brief the board on some work that um, uh, Paul and Steve have been doing in relation to intelligent monitoring. We had planned to uh, launch the intelligent monitoring for general practice uh, earlier this month. Um, but we found as we approached uh, launch date that we wanted to validate the data that we'd got. And as we began to do the validation of the data, it then became clear that the next wave of information based on the previous 12 months will be available within a week of that validation. So it seemed to me to be not sensible to launch this unvalidated and within a week of the most up-to-date data, because the first thing we would have done is have a row about that this is last year's data and is not up-to-date. So. Um, We've um, now got a revised timeline for uh, the publication of the data. Uh, this had been previously agreed with the Secretary of State, so um, Paul and Steve have had discussions directly uh, in relation to uh, the delay of that uh, publication, but um, as I say, with that, that purpose in, in mind. Um, 
Going back to last uh, month's uh, board meeting where we talked about an individual case, um, PHSO has now formally written to CQC and uh, to a number of other organisations saying that they are changing the way that they operate and they'll now consider cases outside of the 12-month period, i.e. they will look and consider historic cases, which is um, a very uh, welcome uh, development. David, on that, I mean, the discussion last time centred around the, Mr. and Mrs. Dixon and their case. Will is, I mean, would the PHSO now be able to take up a case like that? Uh, I think that is right. They would be able to take up a case like that, and that's why this is a very helpful development. And. Um, um, we've also had further correspondence with the family and um, we'd offered to carry out a review under section, an investigation under section 48 of the Act and um, we, we will enter into discussions about how we can do that with them. But if, if the PHSO can now do it, then we, we wouldn't do one under the section 48. Well, there are two different things. One is a, an investigation of their case and the circumstances in their case. And then what we were offering in section 48 is to look at issues such as the transfer of paediatric cases from one hospital to another. So we weren't looking at the individual circumstances, but the general issues. Um, so um, uh, transition issues, um, care after death issues. Um, these are, are consistent with some other cases that Mike um, has had dealings with, and indeed Mike himself have met some families where there were similar issues. So this isn't uh, the issues around transfer around uh, complicated paediatric cases isn't just an issue uh, related to this particular case. It's a more general issue that needs to be addressed, and that's what the Section 48 investigation would do. So one would look at the case, PHSO, and we'd look at the systemic issues, the systems issues, if you wish, that are provoked by the case. So that's how I think this could be taken forward. David, can I just ask? Sorry, it's me. Uh, have they um, made explicit the PHSO? Have they made explicit the criteria by which they will investigate certain cases over not, um, particularly historic cases, because it could be relevant to any special investigations we make concurrently to have not dissimilar criteria? Does that make sense? I understand exactly. Uh, um, the point, and uh, whilst welcoming this, we have gone back, um, and um, I will, um, we will as an organisation have a conversation with PHSO about precisely what this means. We've done a lot of work on um, joint work, memorandum of understanding about what they will do and what we will do. I think in light of this, we'll actually need to revisit those uh, memorandum of understandings to do exactly the, the issue that you're raising, which is saying what is it that they will do and what is it that we will do. I mean, we've previously been on record to the Health Select Committee in relation to the challenges around Morecambe Bay of, of, of actually saying PHSO need to do their job. Uh, and we need to do our job. And uh, we shouldn't do anything which is contingent on what they do, which is the challenge that came in relation to Morecambe Bay. Um, that said, um, we should communicate with each other about what we are respectively doing if it's a case that uh, has some commonalities between what they do and what we do. But our, our powers are not the same as theirs. Their powers uh, are not the same as ours, and therefore we just need to be clear about who's doing what and why. Maybe you can come back to the board uh, when you've got clearer criteria from the PHSO as to, as to what cases they will be looking at. Okay. Could you? Yeah, we can do that. Okay, thanks. switch it off. Um, <laughs> always better, I find. Um, uh, scheme of delegation, I ask you to note that. State of Care report is published on Friday. Um, uh, just wanted to make sure the board were cited on the fact that um, David Dalton has been carrying out uh, a review of uh, options and opportunities for providers in the NHS, and that work is coming to a conclusion. And um, work has been undertaken over the during the autumn uh, by Simon Stevens on uh, the forward view uh, which is uh, looking at the uh, challenges faced by the NHS over the next five years both of those are likely to be published in the next uh, 
few weeks and um, um, I just wanted to ensure that the, uh, the board were cited on those issues. 13, 14 and 15 are updates from uh, Andrea, um, uh, Mike and Steve. Uh, I, I hope the self-explanatory. Andrea describes the work on special measures and the important work on market oversight, which is in place and is progressing well. Um, the update from the hospital's director is an update on progress and David, just on, on the market oversight, um, I think it would be useful to have a paper probably to the private board for the first time, just to see how, how we're going to approach that. Because I don't think everyone is fully up to speed with that. If, if we could have that in yep. ne maybe next month. Yes. Maybe Sally Warren could come, Andrew, as well. Yes, I think that would, that would be very happy to do that, David. Um, I think the work's now ready to go to a meeting, so um, that will be helpful. Um, and then uh, primary medical services um, is an update. <laughs> Uh, in relation to the progress being made by Steve and, and his teams. If I may just add two items, David. On um, primary medical services, there's been a great deal of social media uh, engagement uh, around um, in GP inspections, general practice inspections, and access to uh, records, including access to medical records. There's also some media coverage in relation uh, to this. Um, we do have a code of practice in relation to access to medical records and the responsibility around confidentiality that all of our staff have in relation to accessing medical records. Indeed, CQC and its predecessors, the Healthcare Commission and its predecessor, the Commission for Healthcare Improvement, and CSCI and its predecessor, the National Care Standards Commission, all had access to records and all had confidentiality agreements, codes of practice around confidentiality about what could be accessed. So this isn't a new issue. We regard the legislation on this as being pretty clear about uh, access to records and why this access is allowed. And um, we will revise uh, the code of practice. It's due for revision anyway, uh, in terms of the approach that is being taken. Um, we will, um, I think, set out uh, and write to um, the Royal College of General Practice, uh, the BMA, um, the Health Select Committee, NHS England, and say what our approach is, and we'll uh, get a letter off to people explaining what we do and why we do it. An example of this may well be uh, if we're carrying out an inspection or indeed an investigation to go back to one of the uh, uh, some of the earlier discussions, it may well be that in order to discharge uh, that uh, investigation, we actually need access to medical records. Um, there's been a lot of coverage around the health care of people with learning disabilities, and it may well be that we would want to look about how a learning disability community is being served, in, in which case uh, there is a requirement for each person with a learning disability to have a health plan. And uh, one would expect that if there is a health plan for a person with a learning disability, particularly a person with a profound disability that's living at home in the community, that actually primary medical services would have a contribution to make to that health plan. And one of the ways that we could assess that <coughs> is by accessing medical records. We are not going on fishing trips and fishing expeditions because we can do. Uh, we need to be absolutely clear about the purpose of accessing a record, and that purpose has got to be about um, uh, taking forward our responsibilities. I think it is important we uh, are able to explain our approach and uh, um, um, set that out in some detail. Uh, Steve and Nigel Sparrow have done a lot of work in setting that out. Um, there's a publication called Mythbusters which has set some of this out. We have a code of practice which I think is accessible to people which uh, also sets this out. But I think in light of the coverage, David, it's important to just set this out again and um, state what our position is in this, rather than feeling that we've got to respond through social media and newspaper articles to what this position is, where it makes us look like we're being defensive in relation to this, when actually we've got an appropriate position in relation to this. We've set this out in order to do the job that we've been asked to do, and I think we can set that out uh, in a clear and I hope, Michael, an ambiguous way in relation to what our responsibilities are. 
So this has kind of taken off since this report was drafted, and I thought it was just worth setting out why it was important that we um, um, are proactive in setting out our mm -hmm. position in relation to this. I'm happy to pause at that point. There's one other. Yeah. I'd like to comment on that yeah, as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I think David explained the situation really well. As, as you know, I'm, a, I'm also a practicing GP, albeit only on a Friday. And, uh, you know, I really do understand the, um, the issues of confidentiality, particularly um, as we've had these debates over many years. And uh, as a GP, I see it because I, I see a lot of patients with very sensitive issues in their notes, um, mental health issues, uh, sexual issues, uh, and, and high-profile people who um, also, with everything that's been going on over the years, feel vulnerable about data and information. Um, but our role is really important. It's about making sure that services provided across England are safe uh, and that the quality is good. And um, I think our code of practice stands there and is good. Uh, it probably needs updating with more examples of why we would want to look at the records, just to be absolutely clear. But I do find it very, very sad that the social media storm that um, has happened over the last few days really might frighten people in England um, unnecessarily without thinking about the consequences of that regarding ensuring that they have safe and high quality care. And I think actually in the social media sometimes commentators do need to think about the consequences of their actions as well. Um, uh, what we try to do is do things in a very proportionate way and only look at records where they're appropriate and if possible to anonymise them. And in, in one of the big GP systems you can anonymise data very easily and, and for most cases that's fine. But in some, you want to actually have a look into the depth of the record. So, for example, in the last few weeks, we've been to a practice that had many months of investigations and hospital letters unread, according to the records. In fact, they were so bad that within um, hours of us being in, they apparently, according to the inspectors, and the report is still being written, spent the whole weekend going through those investigations and records. Unless we look into the medical record, it might just be an administrative issue. But if you want to look in and say that a person has had serious diagnoses in a hospital which hasn't been followed up, or investigations that have not been followed up, there is no way of doing that apart from checking the medical record. Now, these are on a small number of GP practices, but if you're one of the many thousands of patients that uh, are looked after by that GP, your life could be at risk. This is very, very serious. And I think one of the problems with social media is it doesn't give you the chance to really explain that. Uh, and I think part of the reason this might have uh, started as a social media issue is that I, I've tried to be very transparent and open. So one of the first meetings I had with all of our inspectors many of whom have come, come from social care uh, and also had access to records for very, very good reasons, and hospital care, was to say, look, this is a very sensitive issue in general practice, and I do not want people going in, looking at records and fishing and looking for stuff without very good reason. And we had a very good discussion about that. Uh, I've also been very keen to issue, as David says, through the Mythbusters idea, additional information on top of the code of practice because we've now got many hundreds of GPs working uh, with us as specialist advisors. We've been so successful on recruitment, we've overshot the target that we gave. They need to understand that their role is different as an advisor to an inspection than being a GP in a surgery. And it might be obvious to most, but we've been trying to train those and give them information. So by being open and transparent, we've exposed ourselves because we're open and transparent. Uh, uh, and I think we do need to be clearer for the public and some of the commentariat why we're doing things, even though I do believe we're very open and transparent. And it's hugely frustrating, but I'm here on behalf of patients. Um, well, firstly, it seems to be absolutely vital that we as regulator, whose duty is to, in effect, protect patients through our, the way, way we 
um, regulate the system to have access to patient notes uh, uh, where, where, where that's relevant. Um, the only question I would ask is whether in relation to our code of practice and indeed any concerns there may be about what happens, do, do we have any regular consultation with patient groups in order to, because after all the notes are owned by patients, they have of course a right of access to them themselves and I just wonder whether we do enough in relation to reassurance in that way uh, to, that any concerns that patient groups get from their membership or who they represent are taken into account. So what we'll do in terms of the letter that sets out our approach, we'll actually send it to patient groups as well, Robert, and uh, invite them in for conversation about um, whether they're content with that and how we take that forward as well. If, if I could add to that, I think uh, all through our consultations and in the other sectors, we've been co-producing our work with patients uh, uh, and uh, groups and charities. I think um, in primary care, where this is um, new is that this is the first regulation of general practice we've had in this country. There has been uh, a substantial uh, number of people who have voiced concern because they don't want to be inspected and regulated. And a few vocal people, both general practitioners and others, who have actively sought to undermine everything we've done from the start. And this is one of many things that have happened on social media uh, to challenge what we're doing. I'm here on behalf of patients, and I think one thing to respond, Robert, would be very helpful is as we publish the uh, reports, as people understand the bad, in some cases, variation in quality of care that's provided, they might understand, and GPs who are now being inspected, all of the feedback, apart from one case since we started, has been hugely positive about our methods when we go into practices. But you wouldn't believe that if you read the social media. But if patients understood, just like a year ago, that, you know, a simple thing about if their fridge in the surgery is not working properly, that can affect hundreds of people's lives and the children of those people who are being vaccinated. Similarly, if you're at a patient, uh, a patient at a practice where they're not looking at the, the investigations and records, it's very difficult in general practice from outcome data to be able to say not acting on this investigation caused this harm because often things happen over a long period of time and are complex because they might eventually get referred to hospital. But those sort of things might contribute to the fact that our performance on one-year cancer survival in this country is not as good as it should be in other countries. And by breaking down each part of the system, uh, I think we can have a, a massive benefit. If patients could understand that, and, and we will as we talk through this over the months and years ahead, explain that, I think they'll understand the risk. Just to offer assurance, uh, Robert, we're currently reviewing the code of practice, and as part of that, we are talking to public and their representative groups as well as to the professionals. It's, it's already happening. Um, David, you had another point. So the last one from me, and this may connect to this transparency debate, is um, um, we received um, a question under the Freedom of Information Act in relation to the uh, transmission of these board meetings, a recording, and, it, and the question was, um, how much does it cost? So um, we formally responded to that request. That went out this week. So um, it's an opportunity, David, just to share that uh, with the full board. Uh, since August of last year to August of this year, we spent £190,000 on the contract with the company that records these video, uh, these um, board meetings. Um, I think the important thing to say um, is that we had 2,000 live views during that period and over 8,000 um, uh, views on demand post the event. Um, that's 10,000 views that have taken place. So what that means is that these board meetings have had 10,000 views either live. Some of those will be our staff, but uh, a, a number will not be our staff. There'll be people... Um, Indeed, I suspect the question came from somebody that had watched a board meeting, but um, 
uh, we don't know that, but um, it does mean that the reach of these board meetings and the fact that we've got a historical uh, record of the board meetings, um, uh, I think is a contribution to the transparency debate and is an important way of actually reaching out across the health and social care sector uh, about what goes on here, the conversations that take place and some of the conclusions that we uh, arrive at and the decisions that are made. So. Um, uh, the other questions were, um, do we televise the whole of the board meetings? Well, no, we don't televise private board meetings, uh, the private elements of the board, and, um, and there is never uh, a second off-camera meeting. I think this was, do you have one conversation in one place and then another conversation? And the answer to that was, no, there are no off-camera board meetings. Thank I, I, you. I think the, the issue is whether we can get the cost of the, yeah. of the filming down, really, as, uh, rather than the principle of whether or not they should be filmed. Sorry, uh, miss that out. We are retendering. The, um, the complaint at the back will uh, know this, but we are retendering with a view to doing that. We did retender um, uh, about 12 months ago, and that took uh, between two and 3,000 off the cost of each board meeting. So we did take the cost down, and there'll be a further retender for the offer. And um, uh, uh, um, we are optimistic that it will be possible to take that cost down. I wonder if there are economies of scale with other uh, government agencies uh, that also film board meetings and thinking of NHS England. Will you take that. take that on board? Yeah. 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 Uh, just to add, I mean, we are um, going through a formal procurement process uh, that will culminate in March, Jennifer. We, ha we have to actually buy from approved list, which is the same list that NHS England would buy from anyway. So the economy scale is held to have been created by the establishment of that framework already. So, um, so we are absolutely adhering to that. Um, thanks, David. Any other questions for David that weren't Paul? Um, on the um, uh, reports from the directorates, there's several mentions in them, starting with um, adult social care, about a report on special measures and then concerns around Medway. I think it would be quite useful to have a report on special measures across them all, um, because I think we're, we're developing today in, you know, in the times that are there around uh, medical um, uh, primary medical services, uh, I think there needs to, that we need some consistency of approach. Um, and I think that would be quite difficult. Um, but I think we do need to have a consistent approach. We can do that for the, I mean, we can do that in, Nova, in November or well, December? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, there shouldn't right. be any delay. I'll, yeah. Okay. A, a small point for the chief inspectors. It's it's it, having read the state of care report, and then I mean there, there has been this this series running in the Times. I think the chief inspectors, quite rightly, have been um, you know pretty tough in what they've said to the Times in in terms of. Um, instances of um, poor quality or the prevalence of poor quality. Um, you know, Steve today was, um, well, it was quoted in the Times today, I think, in a, you know, and he was absolutely direct and crystal clear about the problems. I, I didn't feel that parts of the state of care report were as not quite sure what the right term is, but um, they weren't as direct as the chief inspectors have been um, in the press. And, you know, that, that I think it's a question for the future, but um, I think the state of care report needs to really reflect what the inspectors feel. And I think it's slightly bland at the moment. It, that, as it happens, the, um, the hospital's part of the state of care report actually um, did, I think, uh, capture all of the points that Mike has made in, in public, although the introduction doesn't really uh, I think reflect the seriousness of what um, Mike has been saying, but, but you know the general point is the uh, 
the state of care report should um, be consistent with what with what the chief inspectors are saying, um, because what they're saying is very important and to some extent um, show more problems and more concerns and more worries than the state of care report does. I, I think one of, the, one of the difficulties of the state of care report was that it was largely based upon um, before the new regime came in. Um, and so uh, it, it's not as current as we would like it to have been. But I think it's a, it's a point that's well made, Michael, for, next, for the next state of care report. Andrea? And I, I think I think I, I think I understand um, the point that, that Michael's making, but I'd, I'd say a couple of things. One is, you know, um, I think um, uh, the three chief inspectors in our teams, you know, are absolutely clear and committed to identifying where there are problems and to encourage improvement. But equally, I think that we are also very clear that there's some fantastic care that's actually being provided um, across all three sectors. Um, and we need to celebrate the good as well as um, to tackle um, uh, the things that um, are not quite so good. And, and I think that one of the things that happens when any of us either speak on a platform or um, have an interview uh, in the press is that what gets the attention and what gets the directness um, are the things when we say it's not good, um, and and that's kind of you know what 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 gets an awful lot of the airtime. So I think that you know the state of care report is trying to be balanced across the fact that actually there is some good care as well, um, and um, and I'll give you a plug for my blog this week, which addresses this very matter. So. <laughs> Um, thanks. Anyway, any any other com any other questions for, for David? Steve, okay. I, I, just to comment on the press aspect, I met with most of the health correspondents of the uh, national press to give them the good news about out of hours care, the paper you all read here, and we had hardly any coverage, even though this was a very important statement that since the disaster of. Uh, the Urbani case in Cambridge, care has improved dramatically. Uh, the providers, whether they're private or GP-run uh, groups, have uh, got their act together in a, a very dramatic way. But could we interest the press? No. Um, and then we see this uh, uh, an article about um, accessing care records where nobody actually bothered to ask me either. So, you know, uh, what do you do? <laughs> but I do think the Times the series is a good one, actually, on the um, on, ha on a balanced way. So it's frustrating, actually. Um, okay, uh, uh, Andrea, you're introducing the next paper, please. It's oh, Paul, Paul, it's you a are. double action. Paul's starting. Oh, Paul, sorry. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so Andrea and I both uh, talk a bit to this. Um, <laughs> The paper and the slides that accompany it are aiming to do a couple of things, at least. Uh, one is just in light of the, the board's discussions at the last meeting, just to highlight the journey that we've been on uh, for over a year as we've developed this work. Um, and just to, to start there, the point being this isn't something that we are considering because it's a flight of fancy of ours. This is because this is happening. Um, covert fence and overt fence are something that is being used. We see it in the media. We, uh, we receive it as a regulator. So we need to have a position on it. And that's what we've been uh, on the journey of with quite considerable co-production along the way, some of which is set out in the paper. It's also worth saying that the, this is very much a cross-sector issue, which is why it's, in some ways, why it's not just Andrea presenting it. This um, cuts right across um, general practice um, and hostels, as well as adult social care. Um, it, as the paper lays out, there is no consensus from all the engagement that we've done. Um, it is uh, it was something that polarizes people's views uh, completely understandably, um, and that's also been reported in the press, just how different people's views are, literally at the level of whether you're a, a resident, for example, or caring for somebody in a care home. Um, uh, we think that the basic stance of neither agreeing nor disagreeing with the 
principle and leaving that to an individual um, a family and the um, person receiving services as judgment is an important one. Um, we've reflected carefully on that in light of the board's comments. We think given the wide, wide variety of circumstances, um, it's very important that it is up to the, uh, the individuals um, to make that decision. If there are if there are any points of, um, of consistency in all the consultation and um, the public's views and their providers' views, it's of the importance of guidance so that if we are to um, uh, empower individuals, uh, carers as well as providers, it's important that there is some guidance. That's not guidance about how you set up a camera, um, that we can leave that to others. But it's important that providers and the public are um, uh, aware of our, uh, our position um, and aware of what the uh, the legal framework is, but most important, they can feel confident in um, in the actions that they choose to take, and that's what the um, both the provider guidance and the public guidance that are both currently in draft um, are aiming to get at. So the slides um, set out some of the principles for what would be in that guidance. Uh, we're taking our time developing that. We want to get into uh, to understand from people who be the audience for those two sets of guidance, uh, whether it's um, the right sorts of things. Uh, we have quite an important principle that it should be jargon-free, that it should be easy to understand, um, and that we will test it carefully before we, um, we publish it. So that uh, hopefully uh, gives a flavour of the document, but Andrea. And, and just to, um, <clears throat> to reinforce what um, uh, Paul has been saying. Um, over the last year, we've had um, the benefit of a tremendous amount of uh, insight and involvement from a huge range of people, um, some of whom are in the audience, um, uh, and no doubt listening in as well. Um, and the, the clear message that came through was that what people would find useful is that we would provide them with information. Um, and, uh, and so that would be to help um, both providers in terms of them considering, and, and some of them are very actively considering what forms of surveillance they might um, use and how they might use it. We, of course, will be regulating and inspecting those services. So it's also important for us to understand that when we're assessing um, uh, the service um, that uh, providers have taken into consideration some of the very important issues that we've laid out in the slides, such as you know, uh, the relevant legislation, such as um, involvement of the people who were affected, consent, and all of those sorts of issues. Um, and equally um, for members of the public, to set this in the context of you know, the reason the, the vast majority of the reasons why people end up using cameras is because they have a concern about care that they do not feel has been listened to or responded to appropriately. And so, you know, setting this in the context of explaining what all of the things are um, that people can do and what they can expect um, from providers uh, if they raise concerns. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and then to kind of take them through a pathway that says, you know, share that information with us, um, speak to um, uh, your local um, authority if that's appropriate, um, and frankly, if you think a criminal act has been um, committed, kind of go to the police. I mean, there's, there's a variety of different things um, that people could do. Um, but I, I guess the, 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 the point that I wanted to emphasise is that it is, it is important um, for us to have a position. I think it will be helpful for us to set that out in clear, uh, uh, in clear information for people to use uh, and for our inspectors to be guided um, by. Um, but it's not the only way that we're going to get safe, high quality, effective and compassionate care. You know, actually, the standards that we're setting, um, our expectations of what um, providers will be doing, how they recruit, um, train, support and develop their staff, and all of the issues about culture that we were talking about earlier as a board around the duty of candour, all of those things are absolutely fundamental to making sure that um, uh, sure that we um, we do see um, the high quality um, uh, care that we want to see for all of our 
uh, all of our loved ones um, and anybody else who is using a service. So I think that we need to see this in that context, um, but recognising that we do, as a regulator, have a very important um, uh, information position to play in, in helping people to make um, what can be very difficult decisions um, at difficult times in their lives. Um, so we've set it out in, in uh, the principles out in the in the slides, and I wasn't intending to go through them kind of page by page because I'm sure you've all had a look. Um, but really, what I think that we're asking for um, is um, a view from the board um, that those principles. Um, set out um, uh, the right issues that we should be um, uh, considering um, and uh, agree that we should use that um, to publish uh, information for the public and providers um, um, as soon as we reasonably can. Thanks very much. Um, I think we're being too cautious uh, and um, I'm very pleased with what you just said, Andrew, actually, because um, that seems to me to be uh, a better, more balanced way of addressing the issue than comes across at the moment in the in the document. So there's a there's a slight risk here that this is just about cameras, whereas in fact what it's about is family anxiety. Once somebody they've been caring for is under the care of somebody else, and the the, the tone of the the documents, the the, the reports come to the board, but the uh, accompanying. Um, slides and um, of course we haven't seen the actual guidance yet but uh, uh, I've got to assume the guidance in draft form is just a little bit cautious just to give you an example it, it's it's very strong on the incredible complexity of the issue uh, he actually says at one point that there is um, this is an extraordinarily complex issue is it I would have thought it was a reasonably straightforward issue um, it refers to um, a hugely diverse range of views I suppose I think there's a s small number of views which will be different, um, but it's not, it's not that complicated. There are several points of view to take into account, but it isn't that complicated. This is about people being anxious about what happens when they're not there, um, and that's not all that complicated to understand. Uh, the, and, and why that's important is that it, 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 it comes across a little bit in some of the rest of the way this is presented. So, for example, there is, um, uh, we're told there's a report, a literature review on the evidence, which uh, concludes that there is no definitive evidence. Uh, now, um, you know, I've been around the academic game for quite a long time, so I know what that means. That's quite a cautious position. That isn't a neutral position. That's a cautious, conservative position. Um, I would have been astonished if there'd been, if there'd been definitive evidence. How, how would that have been obtained? Um, what there is is um, evidence of individual cases where it's quite clear that cameras have been helpful and identifying criminal acts, identifying abusive patients, um, and, uh, and, and that needs... So, so in certain circumstances, the evidence is quite clearly positive, quite clearly helpful. And that's slightly different from saying there is no definitive evidence. And I th think we need to be able to reflect that. It's not a... Um, our, our position at the moment is... Uh, is, is a little bit too objective, a little bit too neutral, and as a result, a little bit too conservative. So to give you an example, I, I'm unhappy about the language of we will neither encourage nor discourage, because I think that is, um, is by definition, a discouraging position. Uh, it's, um, it's, uh, we, I think we have to be prepared to say that in certain circumstances, uh, cameras can be helpful, and these are what the circumstances are. Um, so it, uh, it, it's therefore a matter of judgment as to whether these circumstances are fulfilled in this particular in the case that we might be uh, asked about. Um, but it's not... Uh, and then some information about how that might um, be carried out. I, I take your point, it's not just about how we might... Uh, how someone might set up uh, a camera. But uh, what if somebody says, well, where do I get a camera? Um, what sort of camera will do... Are we going to say, well, sorry, we are not taking an, an encouraging position, we're not going to tell you that. Uh, I, you know, there are some, we, we have to um, take a position that in some circumstances this could be helpful and therefore here is the information you might need uh, in, those, in those circumstances. So my, so my concern is that we're seeing a little bit too much about cameras, not enough about family anxiety. And for that reason, we, the, most of what is in the report at the moment, or in the, the report to us, is about, overt, is about covert surveillance and not very much about overt surveillance. And I think that it is quite possible that overt surveillance may actually be much more important than covert. 
um, so uh, because it's pr potentially preventive. Uh, and uh, checking up on somebody having been abused is obviously quite important, but setting into a system a means of discouraging abuse is probably more potentially more imp uh, more important and, and uh, uh, ultimately more effective. Uh, so if you look at the moment, we've got a situation, um, a comparable situation with the police, where uh, there's a you probably know there's a there are pilots going on in the police force at the moment where people are police are being asked whether they want to wear um, cameras on, in their helmets so that when they confront members of the public who are uh, maybe uh, arrested, there's a record, a, a filmed record, and that's voluntary. Um, and so there's concern that it, of course, will only be adopted by those, uh, the, by the police officers who have nothing to hide. Uh, and uh, but the result of it, so, well, the result we don't know the result yet. But the early anecdotal reports um, are that the police themselves are seeing it as positive. So it's it's a measure to protect the public, but it's the police themselves who are saying that this has been helpful, uh, because sometimes complaints are not true. Uh, and uh, are mistaken, and uh, they're saying here is a way in which we can demonstrate our practice. Uh, and and I, I don't know whether we're capturing that benefit of overt surveillance on prevention and the general standard of, of behaviour. So um, I hope that what you said at the end there, Andrew, is properly reflected in the, in the eventual guidance. I think we need to be able to say, um, what will we do, exactly what will we do, if somebody comes to us and says, I want to use a ca camera, what, how do I go about it? Uh, if a whistleblower comes to us and says the same thing, uh, we need to be able to say, would we ever do it? Would we ever? Um, uh, I'm not sure whether we've got the answer to that yet, but it's not in the paper. Um, and I think we've got to say, what do we? View, how do we view overt surveillance? I mean, I, uh, you know, there's the interesting HC1 survey in, that you refer to, where um, uh, most of the families were in favour of cameras, but only less than half the residents who were so. Now, the, the conclusion for that is that the slight implication that therefore the families are slightly out of step with what residents want, but actually what that shows is the tremendous anxiety that families feel on this issue, which we've got to reflect. And maybe therefore we should be prepared to be more positive about what overt, overt surveillance might achieve and reflect that in the ratings that we uh, apply to to um, providers who are prepared to take this general step to improve the uh, standards and re reassure the, the public, reassure their um, their families. So there are some very specific questions which are not about neither encouraging nor discouraging. They are about the practicalities and the impact on our work, which I feel we haven't quite got to yet. Um, thank you, Lewis. That was a really interesting. Yeah. Uh, Paul, did you want to come back on that? Yeah, I think we both might. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, th there, is a, there is a lot in this. Um, and I think Andrew will want to, to, to comment on a lot, of it, but, and, and probably particularly about the, um, the level of advice that we want to give, um, and it's appropriate to give as a regulator. Um, the compl if I just take the complexity point you mentioned at the beginning, um, I take your point that there are a limited range of different views, but sort of precisely because it's so polarised, I get that. Um, but it's not just the... It, it's not just where people sit on the spectrum. It's the complexity of in an individual situation that we're um, highlighting that uh, a resident may or may... of a care home, to take an example for a moment, may or may not have capacity. Their capacity may change over time. Their views, of course, if they do have capacity, are, are must be the... The, the starting point, the ending point, they're the ones who will be on camera, whether it's overt or, or covert. The, it's, the complexity comes in because, of course, there is enormous anxiety from families and, uh, and friends and carers. Uh, there's complexity because the cameras uh, may or may not be placed in public areas. Um, there's complexity because of the, uh, the caring environment itself and the hospital environment is a different environment to, uh, to a care home, for example. So it's, it's more that complexity that we're trying to tease out, not, and certainly not to say, because it's inherently difficult, we'd better just sort of throw up our hands and not worry about it. Um, so I think that's, that's an important point. I'm going to leave Andrew to talk about the how far we reach in. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, I think there's, there's a variety of things, and we could probably kind of have this conversation for several hours, and I do with lots of people, um, but I'll, I'll try not to do that. Um, if you, you ask the specific question, what would we do if somebody rang up and said, um, uh, I'm concerned about care and I want to put in a, uh, in, in a camera uh, and, and what do I do? Um, well, I think that 
our response is, you know, very glad that you've shared with us your concerns. Let's talk through what those concerns are. Um, what, what action can we take um, uh, uh, in response to those concerns? And people are raising issues with us on a regular basis, which means that um, uh, we follow those up, we um, go and um, we, we, we do responsive inspections as a consequence of that, um, and we can tackle problems in that way. Um, so, you know, we actually welcome people kind of coming to us, um, and, but I don't think that our response would be go down to Argos and get a camera and put it in the, uh, put it in the bedroom, because actually I think that that's abrogating our responsibilities for the work that we should be doing in responding to people's concerns and actually proactively managing that um, as the regulator um, and the inspector. Um, so, so I think it's more of a, a kind of holistic response rather than a, a specific response um, in that way. The second um, thing that I'd say about um, uh, overt surveillance, um, the guidance that um, we've been kind of developing and thinking through in terms of the information that we would provide to providers specifically addresses the overt surveillance um, uh, 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 issue because in the main, that's what providers are considering doing, and some have already done it. Um, and um, there's, um, so I think that what, we're, what we would be doing there is being absolutely clear about the issues that we would expect providers to take into consideration, so that if they were using um, overt surveillance, they were doing it for the right reasons, they were kind of um, uh, ensuring that they had consulted and involved people um, within the service, um, uh, and those that matter to them, um, that they were absolutely clear about how they were going to use the information and the footage, um, and, and and how people's dignity and respect, um, uh, as dignity was going to uh, and privacy was going to be respected. Um, so I think that um, you know that will that will help um, in terms of ensuring um, that people aren't just putting up cameras and not thinking through the consequences. Because, you know, there's likely to be footage which um, uh, uh, of people um, who may well be in vulnerable circumstances, um, which um, we wouldn't want to be used in an inappropriate way. So I think as making sure that that was the case is really important. And the final thing I think I'd say on this is that um, and the reason why I would not be keen for us to link um, uh, the introduction of overt surveillance to ratings is that I don't want I, I don't want us to think that this is the way that we get good quality care. You know, there are a variety of. Um, uh, 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 telecare and various other techniques, which I think can be very helpful and supportive in terms of improving um, the quality of care of people um, across all of our, um, our sectors, although obviously we've been concentrating a lot on the adult social care sector in this conversation. Um, because you, know, you, you talked about the law of unintended consequences earlier, Lewis, in, in, in relation to the fit and proper person. You know, there is the potential of the law of unintended consequences with this as well. Um, and we've seen that in, in, in other circumstances where technology, um, like electronic fetal monitoring um, in maternity services, we thought that was the best thing since sliced bread hooked up loads of women to machines, um, midwives sat at the, the nurses' station looking at um, machines that went bleep. Um, and what we know is that women not being able to mobilise and not having one-to-one -one midwifery care is actually you know, detrimental to a good delivery and labour. Um, so what I don't want us to end up is kind of getting ourselves into a situation where we think that technology is the answer to um, uh, good quality care, when actually fundamentally the answer to good quality care is um, enough staff who are properly recruited and trained and supported to do a good job day in, day out. And if I'm expecting people to um, pay attention to how they're going to deliver on the standards that we're expecting, that's, what, that's where I want them to focus their efforts. This might be something that they can use to supplement that um, and, to, and to help in some specific circumstances. Um, and, you know, and I think that we have a role to play in making sure that that's done properly. But I don't want them thinking that the first thing that they've got to do to get a decent rating from CQC is put a camera up. Um, well, now I'm getting more concerned uh, because <coughs> I, I, I don't think anybody thinks that. 
So that, I don't really honestly think that is an argument. That I don't know anybody who, who supports the use of cameras who thinks, therefore, you don't need to do all those other things because the technology is the answer. And so I think that is a misreading of why peop what people are telling us. They're telling us that they, they, of course, they want the right staff numbers and all the other things, staff training, everything else, but they also still have a fear that their usually elderly relatives, sometimes with poor, in a poor cognitive state, are vulnerable in a way which they can't feel reassured about. And, we've, and, and it, it is our job to reflect that overall concern in the way that we respond to this specific issue. So what you were saying earlier about trying to set it in a broader context is right. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean that we should then take a conservative view of this, this specific issue. So, for example, um, uh, uh, maybe I, I was wrong to pick up the particular issue of what the technical equipment should be and where you could buy it. I didn't particularly mean to get onto that. Um, I just mean that if people ask about that, I think we've got to try and have an answer. More important would be that if people report something to us which sounds like it's credible, what will we do about it? Putting aside the issue of, of uh, the camera, will we say, um, well, here is what you can do about the camera. Um, in the meantime, this is so, sounds so serious that here are the actions that we will now take. Um, and that, of course, is, is, uh, is vital. Uh, on the question of, um, uh, you know, of course, I understand that on the overt surveillance, that what we'll, we would then look at was, has the camera been put in properly? Have all the issues of consent um, uh, been addressed? Uh, the issue of public versus private and so on, people's dignity being respected? Of course, that's all very important. But once you've done that, um, could there be some credit for um, taking seriously uh, an issue of public and family concern? And I think we have to directly address that. Personally, I think that um, the answer is that if you have done it properly, and if you think uh, if you can uh, make the argument for the potential benefit, then that is um, a reason to to offer credit to the to the provider. So uh, I won't keep going on, uh, but I, I I do think there are some there are these. Uh, uh, the, the issue breaks down into a number of questions on which we can have a positive response. And so the position of being rather neutral about it, I think, is giving the wrong, uh, the wrong message. Thanks. Can, we, can anyone else like Paul? Yeah. Can, can I just ask one question? Can I just ask one question, right, which is um, you, you mentioned about the, the, the uh, research through literature as to, as to whether or not there was anything which actually could confirm one way or the other. I, what I wasn't clear from that about is whether actually enough research has been done on the use of particularly overt uh, surveillance and whether we would, if, if research has not been done, then whether we would encourage providers to do some sort of research that would look at what are the best ways of using overt surveillance, what are the benefits, how do you use it in a way which is really constructive? Because. I, I feel at the moment that, we're, that the stance we're taking is, is a bit Luddite in that respect and, and, and it's not actually saying, well, could there be benefits from greater use of technology of which overt surveillance might be part? If Robert wants to go in, then I can kind of... Well, um, really, I had um, just, I think, four points to make. The, the first is, and, and I appreciate we've got slides rather than what will be the appropriate, the, the full guidance, but um, we, we, we've got guidance for providers and we've got guidance for the public. But there's actually another very important group of people here who are the staff. Uh, um, notoriously, staff potentially get into trouble if they're registered practitioners for undertaking covert surveillance, and yet that is demonstrated to be really valuable in some cases. Now, I appreciate it may be thought that there are other regulators whose job it is to give that guidance, um, but it seems not to mention anything at all in ours about that leaves a bit of a, of a hole. Um, the second point was dealing with um, uh, just mentioning what Lewis had to say. Um, we, perhaps we ought to say something about the the, uh, the anxiety that triggers this and w what that sig should be signifying to providers and indeed uh, the organized, our organization. So if people come to us worried, what, what are we doing about that anxiety? And what should, if, if a, uh, someone goes to a provider and asks for surveillance, what does that signify that there, there's something wrong going on already? Uh, the, the, the third point w was this. Understandably, it looks to me as though this guidance is principally focused on 
um, um, the adult care sex because that's where this happened. But, uh, but uh, it seems to me potentially different considerations apply in the hospital settings. Uh, um, uh, surveillance has been used in relation to uh, su suspected child abuse in paediatric departments, by way of example. And there are arguments in, about whether there should be wider use of security cameras and so on in hospital than is. And we, we know from 24 hours in A&E that you can set out cameras and just, if you really wanted to do so, watch what everything is going on in the hospital. The other point is there's potential over that because we also know that some forms of treatment in surgery are routinely uh, 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 filmed the whole time, partly for educational purposes, but also partly for record keeping. And I don't know what, what if any routines are put in place to alert patients to the fact that that is actually happening, useful as it undoubtedly is. Now, uh, I, I appreciate that that's a stretching it a bit, but if you have no guidance at all specific to hospitals, I think I would suggest there's a little bit of a, uh, of a gap there. And the other point is, and this is just a question really, um, is the guidance going to sufficiently, apart from whether we sit on the fence or not, is it sufficiently helpful in terms of the detail it's going to provide either to a provider or to a uh, a member of the public uh, 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 to say this is really complicated, you've got to consider it, or, or should we, I'm afraid, go the extra mile and actually set out either a decision-making process in more detail, maybe a reference to what the legislation actually is, um, because frankly, I, I know a little bit about this field, but I couldn't tell you what the legislation is. People need to, need to have access to that, um, rather than just saying to them, it's very difficult, think about it carefully. Um, that, that would be my, those would be my observations. Anyone else like to make an observation? Michael, did you want to say anything? Sorry. You, no. <laughs> I think the, the slides aren't numbered, but um, there's a slide. I, thi I think it's the second slide, actually, principles uh, for guidance for the public. W which I thought was um, actually quite confusing for the public because you know, we say that um, if people are concerned, they should talk to the provider, and that, that's absolutely the right thing. Um, and then to set out what people can do if their um, concerns remain unresolved, that's true too. Um, we want people to tell the CQC about their care. Uh, particularly where providers have not responded well to those concerns. I mean, that's um, that's absolutely right. <clears throat> but you know, then we get on to sort of, I, I suppose again much vaguer territory. We don't encourage or discourage the decision as a decision for families and individuals to take. There are other types of technology. I don't know what those are um, that are less intrusive. And then finally, we will actually use the evidence provided by um, surveillance. So, you know, half the page sort of is saying that, you know, we don't encourage or discourage, but our last point is we will actually use the evidence that uh, surveillance provides. So I, I, I sort of felt we need to be much clearer on this, um, on this page. And maybe the most important point to say is that is the one Andrew made. If you have any concern about the way your um, relative or friend is being treated, uh, call us first and we will investigate straight away. I don't know if we're prepared to say that, but that would be actually a very, a much more direct response to this you know, concern, as, as Lewis pointed out, than this rather vague um, set of bullets here. And if we did respond straight away, and incidentally, there's another um, slide somewhere here which said you've got a choice of going to the um, PHSO, um, the local authority, the CQC, and so on. Um, 
which, which I think is quite co confusing for relatives because I think when there is a concern, they want some immediate action taken. And I think if we could say that, you know, if there is a serious concern, we will, you know, inspect within the next week or two weeks or, well, hopefully the next week. Um, that may take a lot of the anxiety about whether to use surveillance away. Um, if we ourselves then do the inspection and we're just uncertain about the quality of care, then I think we need a position on whether the CQC would install some sort of surveillance or whether we say to the relative, look, we've inspected the home again. Uh, we haven't found anything that suggests that there is um, a problem here. But if you're convinced that your relative is being mistreated, um, then we would support you um, in installing some kind of surveillance. I just, I think in a way where um, we need to give just much clearer guidance. And as I say, probably the first thing is that we will inspect if somebody comes to us. And, you know, that's, the, in a way, the most important message to get across. But, of course, I don't know, and, and Andrea can tell us whether, in fact, we do have the capability or the resources to inspect within a week if a relative comes to us. I, I don't know. Yes, I, I, I'm trying to take down all of the comments that people have made, so I hope that I respond. But um, um, uh, but pick me up if I if I miss any any out. Um, and I think that um, the the point that everybody is is making, and maybe the kind of translation of this into slides doesn't. Um, uh, doesn't get across what we would be trying to achieve in the information sheet that we um, that we would want to put out. Because I think our starting point is this is about responding to people's anxiety um, and and helping them when they're in a difficult situation. And that's kind of the reason why we're doing it. And I think that in terms of the language that we would use, um, uh, it would be it would be in that way. Um, the um, Andrew, just 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 sorry to interrupt. I want to be rude. There's quite a lot to come back to. I, I, I suppose my feeling is is that we're not quite there yet with this. Um, and what I'd like to suggest is, is if you could take it away, you know, with the comments that have been made, and maybe come back at the next meeting. I don't, I don't feel that we're quite there yet either. Are you happy with that? We may not be happy with it, but are you... <laughs> <laughs> yep, uh, we can have another go. Have, have another go. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. David, can I just make one point about mm. just to try to be helpful about it? I, th I think the, the um, uh, I would actually move away from having um, a sort of definitive position. We, I think we've, we, we've ended up sitting on a fence when actually there did, doesn't need to be a fence here. Um, it's just a set of thing, ways of responding with, to certain circumstances and a kind of process to be gone through. Um, which is measured and proportionate and so on, uh, but in the end reflects the anxiety. So I, I just I would get away from the language of having a position to a, a, pra a practical document of what we would do in under certain circumstances, how this will affect our work and so on, and, uh, and get away from the encourage discourage. You know, I, I don't think that's necessary. Actually, in fact, it's distracting from the overall messages. You know, you've, in, in what you said earlier, you, you articulated a, a, a good set of responses, um, and I think that's the, in the end, the heart of what this should be about. Um, I think it was. It it's, may not be complex, but it's difficult. I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, any 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 other business? Uh, any questions from the floor, please, David. Um, well, I, I'd just like to welcome one particular aspect of what we've just been discussing, this guidance and these slides, and that is that the, there, it does seem as if there are going to be separate uh, guidance for members of the public and for providers. And I don't think that was always the case, at least I was left with the impression there was going to be one lot of guidance. And I think that it's very important that because the law is so different, um, for the different um, different groups, and also going back to Lewis's point, uh, I think guidance for providers is mainly about overt, 
Uh, on the other hand, the ordinary member of public is rarely going to put in um, uh, anything other than covert guidance um, because they wouldn't be allowed to. Probably. Um, on the question of sort of sitting on the fence and being neutral, I think it is possible to be neutral about encouraging people. But as you say in this, uh, it's people's own decision. If they come to you with having made a decision, then I think you could be encouraging. Um, uh, and you could be positive, perhaps, about helping them to do so. Because I think people, um, I'm certainly I know myself, are quite worried about putting in a camera. It's the first time, probably, that they've actually sort of done it in their lives. Um, and also, I think you could be a lot more positive than you seem to be going to be about showing an interest in the result. You've got to remember, I think, that in the past, CQC said they wouldn't pay the slightest attention to any surveillance evidence, and I think you need to counteract that impression. And going back to what Andrew was saying about there being lots and lots of other methods, I would just like to sort of throw a contentious issue in. Panorama's great success with cameras was because they put, no, great success in their recent program was because they put a mole, an undercover member of staff, into the old deanery. And I think the CQC should, in addition to cameras, be thinking about that as well. Can I just deal with, quickly with the point that says if somebody came along with um, uh, evidence from um, a, a camera which actually um, was um, evidence that um, uh, demonstrated that either poor or, uh, care or unacceptable levels of care or abuse had occurred, we absolutely would take notice of it and use it. So, you know, um, and that would be that would be part of the information that we provide. So, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to say that, David. got a couple of questions about the fit and proper person test. Um, I understand the CQC's position is that it doesn't assess whether directors are fit and proper per se, but assesses the process which is being used and ensures that that's a proper process. Um, so my question is, if a CQC um, reaches the judgment that uh, the process isn't um, effective and fit for purpose, um, what action will result from that? And the other question I just wanted to clarify from your report, David, um, am I right in thinking that the CQC is still leaving open the option that in some cases, if there's compelling evidence um, that someone might not be fit and proper, that it could use its enforcement action to remove that director? Um, Paul can answer, but uh, this is an unusual way to do questions to the press. <laughs> but anyway, let's do this on the record. Um, uh, what action, um, if not a fit and proper person, then our normal enforcement action can come in to play. And um, it will inform, Mike, I think, the, our judgment about how well led that organisation was if they're appointing people to that organisation that are not fit and proper. Um, I think the other issue about this is the reputational impact of this is something that doesn't get talked about a lot. But I think the power of us saying, actually, we're not convinced this has been done in the right way. Uh, this is our evidence for arriving at that judgment. This is our judgment overall about the organisation. I think the force of that will be felt quite powerfully. So I just draw a distinction between any enforcement remedies that we've got and uh, the reputational impact. On your, on your specific point about would we remove directors, we just need to be very clear on the law here. The, um, we, we don't have uh, legal powers over employment status. What we do um, is, uh, and can do is enforce against regulations. So the, if there's a regulation about fit and proper person, uh, then we will put a conditional, an extremism, uh, conditional registration that that person was not in a director's position. That's just to be accurate about the law, that's what happens. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Two questions, if I may, on duty of candour. Um, the first one relates to the Act. Now, it was my understanding that under the Act, there is a criminal offence uh, 
established in which someone who caused serious harm to patients could be prosecuted. Now, I haven't heard anything about this particular part of the Act recently, although it was discussed at some earlier board meetings. Is this, is this legislation still in place? I'm really sorry. Can you t the specific of whether we can prosecute individuals? Just, just, just help me on the question. Well, I understood, and I might be wrong, that the Act made provision for the prosecution of persons who might have caused, quite possibly, repeated serious harm to patients. Now, presumably, a criminal prosecution would not be a matter for the CQC, but I have heard no further reference to this particular part of the Act. Um, no, it, it does exist. It's, it's separate to the duty of candour. Um, I'll get its name wrong if I try to say what it is, but it is the, um, the new legislation that does uh, allow for, uh, for criminal prosecution. It would be by the CPS, uh, not ourselves, in instances where, instances where an individual has caused serious harm. It's, clearly, there is, there is already the whole criminal law, uh, but I think there was uh, felt to be a, a, a gap in the ability to particularly prosecute those cases. But as my understanding is, that's now legislation. Thank you. Uh, the other question relates to the um, duty of candour and the apology from a trust or possibly in future from general practice uh, to a patient or their family where there had been an incident and the patient had uh, suffered. What, what would happen if the patient or their family felt that that had indeed been the case, but that the hospital or the GP practice disagreed? Um, so the the test on the specific our, our bit of the duty of candour, the social uh, duty of candour, um, uh, is whether there is there's been moderate harm or greater, and the definition of that, as you know. So in a case where there's a disagreement, um, we would reserve the right to, to to look at that, um, and if our you know if we if we had chosen to investigate that, and particularly if there was a pattern of such cases, um, if our view was that the trust was getting it wrong then that would be grounds for us enforcing on that basis. It's also, um, we'd also be looking more widely in terms of the leadership and culture of the organisation as to how they handle those types of complaints and whether they did it with sensitivity. So do I understand the onus would be on the patient or their family to complain, uh, to report to CQC that there was a disagreement? Not let, it, it could include to CQC and, um, and part of our public engagement work that takes place before any hospital inspection is to invite people to, to talk to us about any of their concerns as well as about the good care that they're seeing. But of course they will also entitled, entitled to and we encourage them to uh, raise their concerns directly with the provider and then we look at the concerns that are raised with the provider so we can catch it that way if you like as well. But ultimately yes, it's, if there's a disagreement then at some point the member of the public has to uh, explain to somebody that disagreement, otherwise nobody knows that disagreement exists. It would be very helpful for the, for the member of the public to know where they go if there's a disagreement. Thank you. 